My name is Pat Anschutz for those who are at home and today's sermon is called Pick Up the Stone and it comes from 1 Samuel 17 and I'll be reading selected verses from 1 to 50 with some commentary as I read. <coughs> now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, the Israelites occupied the other, with a valley in between them. Now you'll remember that when the Jews came out of slavery in Egypt, God gave them the promised land, and he gave them a lot more than they ever claimed. Originally, he said, you will claim from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River. They never claimed all that land. And one little piece they didn't completely claim was a little tiny strip right along the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and that's where the Philistines lived, and they became as Israel's enemy. As our story opens, these two armies, the armies of the Philistines, the army of God, are lined up on two ridges about halfway between the Mediterranean Sea and the city of Jerusalem, the capital. The Philistines are pretty close to cutting Israel in half and taking their territory. Continuing with verse 4. A champion named Goliath came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Depending on who you read, he's somewhere between six foot six and 11 feet tall. He's a big guy. <clears throat> he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor, bronze, weighing about 150 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves. Think of shin guards. And a bronze javelin was slung on his back. <clears throat> his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed about 30 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. Yeah, but if I overcome him, you'll be our subjects and serve us. No one took Goliath up on the offer. And then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. Let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Goliath is the Philistines' number one warrior. He is very big, he is very strong, and he is very scary. He is well armed. Uh, verse 11 tells us the Israelites are terrified of this guy. And when we go on to verse 24, we're told not only are they afraid of Goliath, when they see him come out, they run and hide. Goliath says, come on, fight with me. Who's man enough? You're a bunch of sissies. Not only is Goliath humiliating every man in the army, the army itself, he's implying that Israel's God is not up to the job of fighting against him. He's better than that. He's bigger than that. No one, including King Saul, who is a warrior, is willing to go out and prove Goliath wrong. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward every morning and every evening, and Goliath took his stand. So these two armies have been on these two ridges facing each other every day, morning and evening. They line up for battle for a month, a month and 10 days. They just stand there and look at each other. If the Philistines are so strong and so tough, why don't they just attack King Saul's army and wipe them out? 
probably because they can't and they know it. All this bravado with Goliath, all this, you know, daring the Israelites to come, it's all psychological warfare. By sending out Goliath, who is big and scary and strong, they can frighten the whole army of Israel into not attacking them. And maybe if they do it long enough, the army of Israel will wear out and they'll just go home and the Philistines will be able to take the land. <coughs> Verse 12. Now David was the son of Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judea, in Judah, excuse me. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. David was the youngest, and he went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and he set out, just as Jesse directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out into battle positions, shouting a war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked how his brothers were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw that man, they all fled from him in great fear. Here David, who's probably about 17 years old, enters the camp. He isn't a soldier. He isn't a warrior. He's just the messenger boy between home and his brother's soldiers. But he hears what Goliath says, and it ticks him off. We pick up the story in 1 Samuel 17, 6. Oh, excuse me, 26. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? When David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger against David. Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep out in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. But what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight. You are only a youth. And he has been a warrior since his youth. So here we have David, the messenger boy. He's willing to go out and do what the soldiers in the army are not willing to do. He's going to go out there and shut Goliath up. While he does ask about the rewards the king might be offering, it seems like his main motivation is how these unbelievers in their scrawny army could insult Israel and Almighty God. When he shows interest in going out and doing this job that should be done, he comes up against opposition from people in his own camp. First, his brother calls him a selfish brat. The only reason you came down here is to see blood and guts and gore. King Saul tries to stop him. Essentially, he tells David, um, boy, I appreciate your heart, but it's impossible. You can't do it. You'll lose, and when you lose, the rest of us are going to lose. But David believes what Goliath is doing is wrong and that it must not be allowed to continue. He has a calling, and he won't be dissuaded. In verse 34, we see how David responded. But David said to Saul, <coughs> Excuse me, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went and struck it. 
and I rescued that sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. Your servants killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. I kind of see a teenager who has a thought in his mind and Saul saying, okay, <laughs> what are we going to do here? Go and the Lord be with you. Uh, Saul dressed David in his own tunic. Saul put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastened on his sword over the tunic, and he tried walking around because he wasn't used to them. I can't go out in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in his pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, David wasn't dissuaded when Saul told him he couldn't win. He has been training for this fight his entire life. He says, being a shepherd is good enough. I know how to do this. God's been setting me up for this my whole life. He's been in fights before, but more importantly, this fight is not about him. This fight's about the honor of God. And David's been in God's training center his whole life, too. This is about a heathen enemy army insulting Almighty God. It's about the enemy trying to take over Israel's territory and making the army of the living God a, a laughingstock. Maybe when David heard Goliath calling out a man, cursing Israel, he was shocked. How can these people not know who our God is? Did they miss Sunday school? How can they not remember that God cared so much for the people of Israel? He took us from being slaves in, in Egypt and took us out. He separated the Red Sea so we could go through on dry land, and then he drowned the entire Egyptian army to protect us. Don't these people remember God loved us so much? He took care of us in the desert for 40 years by sending us food and water every day. He wanted us to have this land. This is our turf. He dried up the Jordan River so we could walk into it. He made the walls of Jericho fall flat. I mean, look at who our God is and look at who this guy is. How can you stand here and allow this? King Saul is not a terrible guy. He sees the fire in this teenage boy, and he wants to protect him. So Saul, who's a pretty big guy in his own right, puts his armor on David, and you can see this teenager who's not filled out yet wearing this man, big man's armor and um, probably swimming in it. So David takes that off, <clears throat> and he suits up, in the protective gear of a shepherd. The gear he's worn his whole life. He's got his clothes. He's got his staff. He's got his slingshot. He's got his pouch. And he picks up five stones. Five stones are the ammunition for the weapon he's been training with his whole life. Resuming the story at verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy. And he despised him. You can imagine a um, big guy, strong guy, tough guy, bring a warrior out to me, bring a man out to me. And they send a kid. And the kid is armed with a stick, a staff. Goliath said to David, Am I a dog? You come at me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by all his gods. Come here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the animals to eat. Now maybe he figured he could bluff David. He could scare him. 
and David go hightailing it back to the camp and hide like everybody else. But it doesn't work because David answers saying, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the arm, uh, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I'll strike you down and I'll cut your head off. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know it's not by sword, it's not by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into my hands. I imagine Goliath, that's bad enough. Goliath may have been, feel, he might have been toying with the boy before, but now he's ticked. Because he, he's not only being challenged, his gods are being challenged. You got a God big enough to take me one? Yeah, right. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly into the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, he picked up a stone, he slung it, and he struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead, and Goliath fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. <clears throat> David picked up the stone. He put it in his sling. He throws it. The stone hits Goliath in the forehead and kills him instantly. Now I'm going to do a, just a little bit of science here. This bone in your head is the hardest bone in your entire body. God knew we would fall forward and hit this a lot. And he planned well for it. If you want to crack this bone, it takes about 2,000 pounds of pressure. A ton, just to crack it. And I imagine if you want to go all the way through it to hit brain, it's going to be a lot more. I would suggest that David didn't kill Goliath. All David did was pick up the stone. And throw it. God provided the force that was needed to take the enemy down. The battle was never David's. It was the Lord's. Like the army of Israel, we have an enemy. Our enemy has an army. And he fights against us. Jesus told us that this enemy, the devil, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He has nothing good for us. And he wants to take over our culture. He wants to make inroads into our churches. And he wants to derail our Christian wall. He will advance and take as much land as we'll give up to him. Because God has given us the land. Like the Philistine army, the devil knows that he and his fiends are no match for those who serve Almighty God. He knows he's beaten. And to counter that, he uses psychological warfare to make God's people think they cannot win. He uses others to humiliate us and our churches and to belittle our God. They tell us, God's weak. You're so stupid to believe in fairy tales. You're ignorant and uninformed. All the people in the church are just a bunch of hypocrites anyway. And so on and so on. And if we listen to that, we're going to drop out of the battle. Rather than being intimidated, we can't listen to that because it's not true anyway. We need to see this as the trick of an enemy who can't win against us. We need to be motivated, angry if you will, to stand against lies. We need to always be amazed with how big our God is. How great our Father's love is that he would save us through Jesus Christ. Raised him from the dead. We need to remember all the times God's protected us. All the God, times God has fought for us. And we need to revel in that. This is our God. And he's called us out of darkness into his light. Even as we decide to take on this fight, there are going to be those in our own camp who are going to come out against us and try to dissuade us. 
like David's brother, they may accuse us of having impure motives. Others, like King Saul, may believe that we're setting ourselves up for a failure and try to protect us by talking us out of it or by encumbering us with things that are with gear that will only slow us down in the fight. Like David, we need to be confident that God has already trained us up to this point for the fight that's before us. God's not shocked. He, oh my goodness, there's Goliath. Oh my goodness, there's Satan trying to harm our Christian walk, harm our churches. He's been training us the whole, our whole life to be in the fight. David was a shepherd. He went out before his enemy with a slingshot. And he said, this Philistine will be like a lion who attacks my sheep. Now perhaps for me as a teacher, that means I need to go into this fight saying, this enemy will be as to me as an uneducated eighth grader, and he will be educated. How has your life experience prepared you to fight the devil? How, what will you say to yourself to psych yourself up for the fight? Finally, the battle we fight against the devil isn't our fight. When Jesus rose from the dead, he smashed all the devil's plans. The battle's been won. The fight still goes on. As David said, it's not by spear or sword that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. The Lord God Almighty is the one who's actually going to do the fighting, and he's going to do the winning. Like David, all we have to do is pick up the stone and get in the fight.